Good morning. The psalmist says, let them know that you whose name is the Lord, that you alone are most high over all the earth. The story we have come to tell is not only of a child who came so long ago, but one who is now Lord of all there is. Let us look to him in prayer this morning. Our Heavenly Father, as we come into your presence this morning, in this season of, of anticipation and waiting, we praise you, O Lord, that we know that you are the Lord of all and that you reign over all the earth. And all, Lord, though our, our world is a troubled world and that we often have troubles in our own lives, we know that through it all, Lord, that you are high and mighty and that you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. And as we worship you this morning, Lord, we ask that your spirit would speak to all who are gathered here today of your greatness and of your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, good morning. Uh, we have a few announcements. Um, tomorrow night, Monday night at 7 p.m., reunion group for those who participate in Tres Dias. Uh, Tuesday morning, Bible study at 10 via Zoom. Wednesday will be our, pray, our monthly prayer time at 7 p.m. And next Sunday, there's a Christmas gathering, including lunch and an ornament swap. So you can see Julie for details for the luncheon. Uh, I heard last week the men can meet out here. We'll be invited to eat, but not for the uh, ornament swap. <laughs> not sure why, but I think, I think the ladies want to, you know, they don't want us to see. The men, they don't want the men to see what they're doing. Hey, I have to take advantage while I'm up here, right? Okay, are there any other announcements? Oh. Thank you, Bunny. Uh, tree lighting was supposed to be tonight at 5.30, and it's been canceled, and there is a new date and time to be determined later. Uh, partnership with the Lions next week. A hat and mitten tree will be available for the benefit of the Blackstone Elementary School. See Norma Myers for details. Seeing this is the first Sunday of Advent, uh, we will have Norma Myers and Liam Hagen to light the candle and do the readings. Today we begin, begin our, our celebration, celebration of Advent. Advent. On these, these four, four Sundays, Sundays leading up to Christmas, we will we are rejoice, rejoice in the great gift that is ours in Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. To help, help us celebrate, we will, we will be lighting, lighting the candles of the Advent wreath, and the candles, candles signify, signify that Jesus, Jesus is the light of the world. The evergreens remind us that he is life, life and brings life, life to us. All of these are arranged in a circle, circle because, because life, life in Christ, Christ has, has no end. end. Each Sunday, we will light an additional candle. Then on Christmas Eve, we will light all the candles, including the center one, the Christ candle. As we do, we will rejoice that Christ has come to us. He is Emmanuel, God with us. On the first Sunday of Advent, we light the candle of hope. Hope is our assurance that God will finish all he has started. Hope is our confidence that he will do all he has promised. All the promises of God are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He is our hope today and forever. 2 Corinthians 1.20 Thanks be to God for this incredible gift. 2 Corinthians 9.15 Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning uh, as your people. We come because, Lord, you invite us to come. You invite us to bring all of our praise and petitions and all the things uh, that we encounter in this world. You ask us to cast it all upon you. For your word tells us that you care for us, Lord. So this morning, we give you praise for this new grandchild and great-grandchild, Lord, 
We pray for the mother uh, and, and for the child that you would uh, speed uh, their, their coming home. Well, they probably are home. Lord, we pray that you would bless this family, bless the, the child and, and the fam uh, mother and the grandparents, Lord. Uh, we thank you for your blessing. We pray for Norma's uh, sister in North Carolina, Lord. We pray that you would be with her, that through your spirit you would comfort her and strengthen her, Lord. We also pray for John, Lord, that you would be with him in this time, uh, that you would sustain him by your grace and by your mercies, Lord. And Lord, we lift up David uh, Baisley this morning in uh, Florida. We pray your hand upon him, Lord. We pray that... Uh, he would recover from the serious injury, Lord, and that you would heal him, uh, and that your grace would be uh, present to him, Lord. By your spirit, speak to his heart in this time, Lord. And Lord, we pray for all those who have gathered today, uh, who have cares and burdens upon their heart that they cannot mention. Lord, we lift them up to you. We lift them up to you, Lord, because we know you are a Lord who hears us, that you are a God who comes to us, Lord. And we give you praise and thanksgiving. We lift up uh, also the troubles that are in our world, Lord. We pray for Israel, Lord, this morning. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray that you would bring an end to that conflict, Lord. But a long-term uh, resolution, Lord, of what is the problems in that region. We pray for Ukraine as well, Lord, in the conflict with Russia. We pray for healing, Lord, for an end to that conflict. We pray for the leaders of our nation, Lord, that you would give them wisdom and, and clarity of judgment, Lord, that they would seek not their own uh, to enrich themselves, Lord, but for the benefit of all. Lord, we pray that righteousness would guide our leaders and right truth, Lord, would guide our, guide our nation. We ask all this in the name of our Lord, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And that is found on page 881 in the Pew Bibles. And I will begin reading at verse 1. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod Tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip Tetrarch of Idurea and Trachoconus, and Lysanias Tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then, the crowd asked. And John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share with one who has none, and anyone who has food should, share, should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect more than you are required to, he told them. Then the soldiers asked him, what should we do? And he replied, don't exact money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. Let us pray. 
Our gracious God, we thank you for this time of the season, Lord, when we can reflect on who you are and the love that you have for us, that you have come into our world. And we pray now that your spirit would guide us in speaking and hearing from your word. Amen. Advent, uh, the word Advent comes from a Latin word and it means coming. And we first find um, the, uh, uh, in church history, uh, an Advent season, if you will, uh, sometime around 1,500 years or so ago. And it is a time of waiting and it is a time of preparation uh, for the coming of Christ into the world. And as such, it is also a time of reflection and preparation. In the world of, of the Jewish world of the New Testament, uh, had uh, long been waiting uh, with longing, uh, anticipating uh, the song we sang, Come, O Come, Emmanuel. That was the state of mind of the Jewish world of that day. They had, been ex they had been ruled for over 600 years by a foreign power. Uh, and the foreign power in that day, in the New Testament day, was Rome. And the Jews of, of this, the New Testament era refused to believe that the story that Rome was telling about itself, that Rome was the good news, and that Rome was the, the source of peace, uh, the Jews living in Israel refused to accept that. They were longing and waiting for the true king to come and set them free. That's the environment of waiting and anticip anticipation and longing that John the Baptist suddenly appears. John has long been a text associated with Advent because he is the one to prepare the people. His own self-understanding was that he was sent to prepare the people for the coming of the Messiah. And John appears like a, 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 a shooting star. Uh, he comes on the scene and his ministry lasts about six months to a year and he is gone. But the book of Malachi had predicted, had prophesied that before the Lord came to his people, he would send the prophet and John was that prophet. So in our text today, which um, you and I look forward uh, typically in the Advent season to Christmas and the birth of the child. But typically over uh, history, it was more a season very similar to Lent in that a time of, of repentance and a time of preparation of our hearts uh, for the coming of Christ. And so today, I, and I have to say I've never preached from John's the story in Advent. I, I go through my files and not once that I do but all my reading uh, lately has kind of pushed me in this direction. And so this morning what I want to do is look at John, uh, the man in his times, the times that he lived in, and his call, his summons to the people of Israel and to us to prepare our hearts. Luke begins his John's story by saying, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, and then he lists six other names under that. And all of those names under Tiberius Caesar served at the pleasure of Tiberius Caesar. Caesar, uh, and, and what's the significance of Luke doing this? Well, for one thing, when he says the 15th year of his reign, we can date that. Uh, we know that Tiberius Caesar came to power in 14 AD. He ruled till 37. Uh, so the 15th year would place John sometime around uh, the year 29 AD. Um, and beyond that, what is the significance? Well, what Luke is doing is anchoring his story in real time among a real people who lived at a real historical moment, just like you and I do in the year 2023. I had to think about that. These names, these names that Luke lists, they're the power brokers. They're the people, guys, who, sh who shape your life if you're living in that time period. Tiberius was the ruler of Rome. He had a uh, 14, 23-year uh, reign. Not a good guy. Not a good guy. Accomplished a lot, but by the end of his reign, he was more feared than anything else. 
But he was the one who ruled all the area, and you lived in that time under his thumb. When I worked for the post office, I worked in uh, the little town of Cumberland, Rhode Island. Cumberland was a branch of Pawtucket. And so we would always hear, look out, they're watching you. But not only Pawtucket, you see, Pawtucket was under Providence. And we always would hear, they're watching you. Be careful what you do out there because if you step out of line, you're going to get caught. Well, in, in the place of our story, Israel, Israel, they were watching. Tiberius was watching, and he had all these little underlings, they were watching. You couldn't step out of line without getting caught. And so while the world was being shaped by these guys, while they were watching everything you did, while people were living under their thumb, so to speak, uh, unable to even imagine that things could be different, there was nothing that they could imagine that would change their lives radically. Into this world, the word of God came to John, the miracle child of Zechariah and Elizabeth. And just as he, he states that verse, after listing all these power brokers in the first two verses, you get the impre impression, the way Luke says that, that the word of God came to John. They're not as important as they think they are. There's something else. There's, something, there's someone over them. They might not be who they think they are. And you know, there's something about the Bible. God always speaks in real moments in time. He doesn't just drop these abstract thoughts into uh, our world, but he speaks to real people who are living in a real moment, in a real uh, historical time. His word does not drop from heaven. Now, Luke quotes from Isaiah, and he says, in uh, that quote from Isaiah is how John understood his own ministry. And Luke says, a voice of one, quoting from Isaiah, a voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Now Isaiah, it comes from Isaiah 40. But Isaiah was speaking to real people. He didn't just record this or speak this or write it down so that someday, 600 years later, Luke could quote it and check it off as, see, he fulfills this prophecy. No, this is a real, Isaiah is speaking to real people who lived in a real moment in time. The time that he spoke to was exile. Israel had been in exile since 587 in, uh, uh, BC, and it had lasted 70 years, but exile is now coming to an end. And so John, uh, Isaiah says, prepare the way of the Lord and make straight paths for him. In other words, what he's saying to him is get the road crews out, fix the potholes, straighten out the bad curves in the road from Babylon to Israel, because Babylon, uh, the, the exiles who have gone to Babylon are coming back. Prepare the road. Prepare the way. And that is, uh, that's the word of Isaiah to a people who are perhaps depressed and despondent, perhaps even despairing, who found it hard to imagine that anything in their lives could be different. So exile uh, defined what Israel's life was. Babylon defined their life for them. And, you know, don't, don't we sometimes have difficulty imagining that things could be different than they are? Don't we sometimes have difficulty imagining that our world could actually change? And, uh, you know, we, we read of the brokenness in the world. And, you know, that, uh, since October 7th, when uh, Hamas uh, started this war with Israel, and the, the reports we have gotten of babies being beheaded, uh, and rape, and murder, and uh, it's it just, I don't know about you, but I feel like, what a mess. What a mess. Abraham, Abraham Heschel, the great Jewish rabbi, said, history is a nightmare. 
And, you know, we're seeing it played out right now. And you know what? Sometimes our lives can become a nightmare, too. Things can happen and come into our lives, and it can become like a nightmare, and we see no way out, no way to imagine that things could change for the better. Isaiah, but Isaiah saw another reality, and so did John. They saw that God was uh, on the move. He was, he was moving towards uh, his people. He recognized that. I got a, um, no, it wasn't a text. I missed a, a FaceTime uh, with my son Benjamin in Montana a few weeks ago. Now, when Ben FaceTimes me, it's not Ben who wants a FaceTime. It's Henry, my six-year-old grandchild. And I missed that, so I, and it was too late to FaceTime, so I sent him a text. Did I miss Henry? He says, well, yeah, Henry and I were watching The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, which is a C.S. Lewis story. And uh, it's a story about how these young children enter this magical world of Narnia through a closet uh, that they go into. Uh, but the, there's a problem in Narnia because it's uh, ruled at this time by a wicked uh, witch who has frozen the land and it's winter all the time. Ah, but there's a rumor. Aslan, the king, is on the move. The lion king is on the move. Things are happening. Things are going on. And Ben told Henry, he says, you know, this is a true story. And Henry says, it's not. Ben says, yes, it is. Ask Pepe. <laughs> so Henry wanted to FaceTime to ask Pepe. But I missed the FaceTime. But. I had a copy of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, a hardback copy, illustrated, so I sent it to Henry. And the, the other night, I'm sitting, reading, and all of a sudden, I see FaceTime from Ben, and I know Henry wants to talk. So he comes up on the screen, and he picks up the book. Pepe, I got the book, but I had also attached a little note. I had said, yes, Henry, this is a true story. You just have to find the door in. So Henry, now understand who Henry is. He goes to a football game on a Friday night, thinks he sees Bigfoot along the woods in the field. So he submits a sighting of Bigfoot to the website, uh, and he is waiting for confirmation that they accept it as a genuine. So he's got an imagination. So I said, yes, Henry, it's a real story. It's a true story. Well, Pepe, where's the door? I said, Henry, you have to find the door. And it's challenging, Henry. Is he, are you sure? Henry, just find the door. So now I know he's walking around Montana. In every corner he goes around. Is it there? Is it there? But in the story, Aslan is in the move, uh, is on the move. And here in this story, the biblical story, John knows God is on the move. He is coming to his people. John's vision uh, is, is and, and, and it's not just as his imagination, okay? He's not Henry imagining Bigfoot out there. This is John whose vision is uh, uh, controlled by the word of God. The word of God came to John in the wilderness. And you know, that idea of the wilderness or the desert suggests uh, how fragile life can be. It suggests that sometimes it, it can, uh, because if you're in the desert or in the wilderness, uh, you are always being threatened uh, and over, to be overcome by chaos or whatever. And sometimes our lives can, can go into a desert or a wilderness. But John was in the desert, and he heard the word of the Lord. And you know, John always strikes me as a really wild-looking guy. He wore a camel's hair uh, for, with a belt, leather belt around. And the picture I have is always the caveman. Uh, you know how the caveman dressed? And uh, he had a great diet. For, for anyone who's on a diet and, and wants to lose weight, locusts and wild honey is what he ate. Um, so he always strikes me as a, a wild guy, and I always see fire coming out of his eyes because the word of God was burning in his heart. But he created quite a scene. Uh, it had been 400 years since Israel had heard anyone say, Thus saith the Lord. And here John is coming with the word from God. And if we say, What's the summary of his message? Is the king is coming. Get ready. No wonder he drew a crowd. 
Because these people were waiting for the true king of Israel to make an appearance. God was on the move, John said. Prepare yourself. And uh, how are they, and in one sense, what John is saying is the same message as Isaiah was saying. And Isaiah had spoken, and it was good news. In John's announcement, it's good news. The king is coming. And people were longing for God to act. And in, throughout the Bible, God always comes, and he always uh, speaks in the midst of real life. It isn't just some abstract idea that drops down from heaven. It's a real life word that comes. And that real life word often poses a challenge to people like Tiberius Caesar who thinks he's in charge because there's a true king. But John's good news that God was acting came with some bad news too. It came uh, because the preparation involved what he called what Luke calls a baptism unto repentance for forgiveness of sins. John called his people to repentance. New life, for new life to break forth, there would have to be a repentance. Have to be washed clean. And that word repentance in Greek is metanoia, a change of mind. There is no English word that captures the full sense of what it meant. Because it wasn't just a change of mind, it was accompanied with a change of behavior. Because what the word uh, signifies is that um, you reevaluate your life, you reevaluate how you've been living, what you've been doing, uh, and what it suggests is that you have come to recognize there's a gap between what I ought to be and what in reality I am. There is a gap between what I sense to be God's will and how I am responding to that. So a change of mind is not just a change of, okay, I, I'm going to think a little different. It's going to live a little different as well. Now, no doubt, for some, in John's, some of John's hearers, it was a very odd message. Because in spite of the song that John preached to Gentiles and Jews, no, John just preached to the Jews. And he was preaching to the Jews who thought uh, they were Abraham's children. They were God's chosen people. And not only so, not only were they God's chosen people, they were also victims. For 600 years or so, give or take a few, they had lived under oppression. And the oppressor at this time is Rome. And ever since Pompey the Great had walked into Jerusalem in 63 BC and gone into the Holy of Holies, Rome ruled Israel. And Caligula, the, the uh, emperor who would be 10 years after John, actually wanted to set up a statue of himself in the Holy of Holies. They were the people uh, oppressed, they were the victims of Rome's oppression. And we all know, uh, of course, that victims cannot be guilty of sin, uh, we are told over and over again. But the prophets got, had said that when God came to his people, he would first cleanse them from sin. So John would have none of their excuses. He saw the leaders coming to him, and he said, Who warned you, you brood of vipers? Can you imagine uh, me getting up here this morning and looking out at you and saying, Who told you to come here, you brood of vipers? That's what John was doing. I mean, that's not exactly uh, how to win, uh, in, win friends and influence people. It's not going to get you a, a, a date on Oprah. But John looked at the leaders. Uh, it doesn't say leaders here, but in, the, in uh, Matthew's gospel, it says the Pharisees. Uh, they were the leaders of the people. That's who John says is a brood of vipers. He would later confront Herod himself, and it would cost him his head. But John's message was not a soft message. It was a message to a people that said that they needed to come and be cleansed. And they had to recognize that this God that they were dealing with is, oh, there's a thing in Chronicles of Narnia where it says about Aslan. And one of the children say, is Aslan safe? And they say, oh, he's not safe. He's dangerous, but he's good. 
And this God that John is talking about, he is a God who can be stern and exacting, but he's good. And so he is calling people and recognizing that if, if there's no response, then judgment will fall upon them. But he also welcomes the people, and the people flock to him. They love John's preaching because uh, he preached with authority and power. It had a thus saith the Lord. And he gave them not just uh, an abstract idea that you have to change your mind. He gave them very practical uh, things of what repentance and what a changed life would look like. So to those who said, what should we do? He says, well, if you've got two tunics, uh, two coats, give one away to someone who doesn't. If you've got a lot of food, share it with those who don't. Uh, tax collectors, the, the, the tax collectors are the lowest uh, in, in, in the world. They, they said to him, what should we do? They said, well, don't collect more than you're supposed to. Because the way they worked was you, could, you had a, a minimum to collect. Anything above was yours. And then the soldiers, what should we do? So he gives all these uh, practical advice of what repentance would mean in terms of their life change. The so people flocked to him confessing and being watched, washed. And the image that I have uh, is the movie uh, that came out last year, The Jesus Revolution, where they were being baptized in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, what a sight. They, all these young hippies uh, confessing their sin and being washed. Today is the first Sunday of Advent. Christmas is ahead, but there's something else ahead as well. Christ will come again. He will come again into our world to heal it. We look out at our world and there's so much brokenness, so much pain. And our lives can be part of that broke. Our lives are part of that brokenness and part of that pain. But we are not victims. We are, uh, John would, how would John speak to us? And so I'm going to leave you with one thought. If John the Baptist were here instead of me this morning and he was wearing one of those camel uh coats of his, and fire was coming out of his eyes, what would he say to us? What would he say to us in terms of how should we prepare, not only for Christmas, but for the fact that our Lord will come, and we will one day stand before him? What would he say? It's a rhetorical question. I'm not going to give you any suggestions on that. Everyone has to do that for themselves. But what would he say? What would he say to our leaders? to our government? To, what would he say to all the politicians who lead us into so much pain and so much bloodshed? What would he say? What would he say to you and I? How are we to prepare for the coming of our Lord? I'll leave it with that. As we come to the Lord's table, as we prepare to take the uh, share in the Lord's Supper, this is what he gave us to remember him by and to help us reflect and to help us to prepare and to recognize that our Lord will come again. To you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after the cup, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Jesus took ordinary bread and he broke it. And he said that this bread is his body broken for us. Took the cup, he said this is, represents his shed blood, which he shed for us, for the remission of sin. God has moved towards us, and he has moved towards us in a way that demonstrates his great love. He was broken, shed his blood, that we might have life.
Eat this bread together, remembering that our Lord was broken for us. Drink this cup together, remembering that the Lord who shed his blood that we might be forgiven is the high king of heaven. He will come again. Jesus Christ, into his world, as ambassadors of peace. Amen. Amen. Just... Thank you.